Thank you much. Let us have a word of prayer. Father, we are before you and before your word. And I ask that you will give us a spirit of understanding of your word so that we may love you and do what you tell us to do. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So the class this morning is going to be uh, an introduction to this letter. And it, uh, hopefully we will finish uh, this morning with the introduction. But there are a few things that I would like to say about this letter written. This letter was written by the Apostle John, one of the 12 that the Lord chose. And uh, there is ample evidence uh, outside of Scripture uh, to substantiate this fact. Uh, there were two individuals who were uh, disciples of John. One of them is Papias, and he lived uh, somewhere between the year 70 and 130. Another one was a person by the name of Polycarp. He lived uh, from about 69 to 155 of our era. And uh, there was another individual who lived a little later who was a disciple of, uh, I believe it was Papias, and this other individual was Irenaeus. And he, he lived from about 130 to 202 of our present era. And these individuals quoted John. Uh, they stated that John wrote this epistle. And uh, why is this important? Why is it important to know that John wrote this epistle? Well, you know that uh, it has to do with the Lord Jesus. Everything about this letter has to do with the Lord Jesus. There is a problem of being addressed in this letter. But the most important thing about this letter is what it tells us about Jesus. And so it is important that we know uh, who wrote this letter uh, because John was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he chose him specifically and he gave him commandment. And he said to, to his disciples, you are going to be my witnesses not only in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, but to the ends of the earth. And so we have uh, the testimony of one individual here who was a personal follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, it is like listening from the, from the mouth of our very Lord. This is what the Lord uh, wanted his disciples to communicate to us. So... Um, now, the purpose of this letter, and this letter was written um, more or less anyway. They are different guesses. Uh, no one knows specifically when it was written. There, there's a range between 65 and 85 A.D. So when you think of it this way, uh, Jesus died around the year 29 A.D. of our present era. Then... A few years later, this letter was written. So we're talking about the first 100 years of the Christian era. We're not talking about later. This is an actual letter that was written by someone uh, who knew Jesus personally. And uh, during his lifetime, he wrote this letter. So there's a lot of things as, as we listen when Steve uh, read the, this letter, there are lots of things there. Some of it is very difficult to understand, but hopefully will become clearer as we, as we study the letter. And why, why, why am I interested in this letter? There are many reasons why am I, I'm interested in this letter, but I would like us to focus on what he says in chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. 
uh, it's about assurance of salvation. That's the perspective that I'm approaching this letter from. Um, you can approach this letter from different, different perspectives, but this is the one that I'm interested in. Uh, that you may know that you have eternal life, assurance of salvation. Now, why is this important? Well, there are many reasons why this is important. In uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, uh, the Lord's speaking about uh, the day of judgment when we will have to stand before him. And he says that many will come in my name saying so and so and so, and I will tell them, depart from me, I never knew you. Now just imagine if you are one of those individuals and all your life you think that you are a Christian and then at that, very, at that last moment you come before the, the Savior and you hear those words. Those are terrible words to hear and you definitely don't want to hear them at that time. So I think it's very sobering. It is very sobering uh, in light of the fact that that's a terrible thing. Then the scriptures tell us also in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, and in 2 Peter 1.10, that we are to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. We are to do that. We can really deceive ourselves into believing that we are Christians when in reality we are not Christians. It could be. And so the scriptures tell us to do it. And the day of judgment, which we are all going to face, uh, is a sobering thing. So we need to find out the here and the now if we are really if we really have eternal life. I think that that's very important. And for me, there is a per that's personal. Because one of the things that I struggled uh, throughout my Christian experience is this issue of, am I a true Christian? And I know I'm not the only one. I've read quite a bit about Christians throughout history and this has been a very persistent uh, problem. And so I'm not the only one. Uh, but the beautiful thing is that here we have a letter that addresses this very specific issue. How can I know that I have eternal life? And to be honest with you, if you are not... Uh, sure of your own standing before God, that can be a very debilitating thing in your Christian life. Very debilitating. At the same time, if you take what the scripture says and put your life in front of this test and you pass the test, it is a very comforting thing. It's wonderful to have your assurance of salvation. And the beautiful thing about this text is, this letter, is that it says that you may know. Not that you may feel, but that you may know. And now, um, I've been a Christian since I was 19 years old, and I have heard all kinds of preachers about having assurance for salvation. One of them is very common. If you remember the day that you lifted up your hand and you passed, you went forward. That, that's nowhere in the scriptures. There are many things that people say about this subject that are not found in the scriptures. But here in this letter, we do have evidence of what it is to be a Christian. So that's the approach that I'm facing this letter with. And believe me, I've spent years uh, putting my life to this test. Um, and it has been very comforting 
to see that what it says here is true in me. And I hope that it will challenge you and it will also encourage you that uh, in your walk with the Lord, that you will come to experience the, the joy, the comfort of God's word in your life. So that's the perspective that I'm approaching this letter. Now, there's another thing about this letter uh, as, you, as we listen and as you read this letter, and I encourage you uh, at home to, to read it for yourself. Um, the way that John writes, the way that he thinks, uh, it's very interesting. If you read the letters of Paul, his thinking is very lineal. You know, he goes from one point very logically to the next point. And it, it's all, it all follows. John is very different. It is he is completely different. He doesn't think that way. John has a different uh, way of thinking. Now, why is this important? This is important because we want to understand the scriptures, correct? We want to understand what it says. And John's way of thinking is rather different from, uh, from Paul. And what, how is it different? Well, John thinks in terms of picture. If I can, if I can put it uh, the way I understand him. Uh, there are some commentators who say, you know, he's thinking in a spiral, circular kind of way. Uh, others people other have said, not, not commentators, but certain people have said, he is very hard to understand. I can't figure him out. In one place he talks about love, and the next one he talks about commandments. He, then he says, by this we know, and he goes all over the place. It appears that he goes all over the place, but no. His way of thinking is pictorial. If, um, it is thematic. Uh, I was speaking to, uh, listening to uh, Forrest, and he said that he had an experience uh, when he went to Japan with a different way of thinking. And the way that Forrest explained it to me, if I recall correctly, is that whenever he was speaking or dealing with a group of Japanese about a, a subject, they all came uh, from different direction. Is that correct? Did I say that correctly? So, um, not lineal, but here's a, here's a thought, here's a problem, and everyone is contributing to it. Now, their thoughts are complete, but they're all explaining it from different perspectives. I think that that is John's way of thinking. So when you read this letter, keep that in mind, because he is going to mention something in chapter 1 that he is going to mention in chapter 3, and eventually he's going to summarize in chapter 5. And in each section, he is developing this thought a little better. Not better, but more complete. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? No questions? Okay. Now, what are the things that John addresses in this letter? And... Remember, we're approaching this letter to know that we have eternal life. To know if we have eternal life. How can you test yourself? So there are four themes that he develops in this letter. Theme number one, and it's not in any one order, is doctrinal. Who is Jesus? This theme number two is the theme of obedience, keeping one's command, God, the Lord's commandments. Theme number three is a moral one, and it has to do with sin, the practice of sin and the practice of righteousness. And the fourth uh, theme that I see in this letter 
is perseverance. Those four things are the things that John deals with um, in this letter, and you can call them tests. Uh, some people have de uh, described them as uh, distinguishing traits of Christian character. There is a book, actually, I, I read that a long time ago, Distinguishing Traits of Christian Character. I don't remember who, 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 who's, who's the person that wrote it, but it's one of those classical books about Christian character. So, uh, doctrinal, uh, the theme of obedience, the theme of uh, a moral theme, and perseverance. Those are the four things that we're going to see in this letter developed, uh, which we can use to test ourselves to see if we are in the faith. Because we want to know, I, I want to know if I am saved or am I deceiving myself. And I think everybody should, uh, the scriptures tell us to do that, to test, uh, to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. Now, uh, Here's uh, the last point this morning, the last um, item of introduction. Uh, why did John write this letter? Why did he write the letter? Obviously, when I write a letter, there is a reason why I write it. And usually, when I read uh, a book, when I read uh, the scriptures, uh, the one question that I always ask is, why was this written? Why, why was this statement made? And so, there, is, uh, there are two uh, reasons that we want to think about uh, in answering that question. What caused John to write this letter? What, uh, what motivated him? And uh, I want you to look in Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 11. This is just a little bit of uh, background to, um, to getting to the reason why this letter was written. Matthew 24, verses 9 through 11. Here's a, here the, here's a Lord Jesus. These are his words. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And here's the key uh, verse that I would like you to uh, keep in mind as we as we consider why John wrote this letter. Verse 11, And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Many false prophets will arise and will lead many astray. Now jump in, uh, to Acts chapter 20. John, uh, Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30. This is uh, the Apostle Paul speaking to the elders uh, of the church of Ephesus. And this is what Paul says. Chapter 20, verse 28. By the way, uh, Dr. Kistler uh, has a, a, a great message on this passage. Uh, you can find that on YouTube, uh, specifically on, on this section that uh, deals with uh, Paul speaking to the elders of the church of Ephesus. It's a great, great message. Uh, verse 28, he says to the elders, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to take care for the church of God, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know 
that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So the Lord speaks about false teachers arising. Paul, a few years later, at this church in Ephesus, and by the way, um, the historical tradition is that John was a, a, an elder, a pastor in Ephesus. And he is, the letter, 1 John, is written to the churches in Ephesus. So here we have Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus that he founded. He spent three years there founding, establishing this church. And he calls the elders of the church. He's not going to see them anymore. And he tells them, I know that from among yourselves, you know, false teachers will arise and will deceive and, you know, cause havoc in the congregation. So the Lord has been preparing his people for this eventuality, that false teachers will come and infiltrate the church with false teaching and create havoc. Now listen to what Peter, in Second Peter uh, chapter 2, Verses 1 through 3 says, on the same, uh, the same vein, Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Then you jump into to chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, and here, he's speaking again about uh, uh, this, these people. Chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. And he says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So here we have the Lord. We have Paul. Obviously, we have John, as we will see. And we have Peter. Every one of them informing the believers that false teachers will penetrate the church with wrong uh, teaching uh, to deceive, uh, to carry people away, to make uh, business out of them. John, in writing this letter, it is, uh, is addressing that very problem. It has come to fruition already. Now, uh, as Pastor Frank has been preaching um, through the book of Acts, we saw the, uh, you know, when, when the message of Christianity, when the Lord came and uh, the Christian faith was proclaimed, it was proclaimed in a Jewish environment, right? The first the majority of the first Christians were Jews or Jewish proselytes who converted to uh, uh, proselytes, Gentiles who converted to Judaism. So the majority of the Christians were Jewish. And 
they, that, that environment had an impact on Christianity. So, and we see it uh, in what is called the Judaizers, that they, um, basically they were saying, in order for you to be a, uh, saved, in order for you to be a true Christian, uh, you need to follow certain things. And Paul, very clearly, and Peter, said no. You know, that's not, that's not the case. We don't need to become Jews in order to be saved. That is not biblical. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, plus nothing. That's the message. That's the message of Christianity. So when it, when it was in that Jewish environment, the, that collision came into being. Now, as the gospel moves from the Jewish environment into a Gentile environment, it comes into conflict with other philosophies, with other systems of belief. And what was the system of belief that existed at this time in the Greek world, especially in Ephesus? In, in this city where uh, John is writing this letter to the church. And our time is almost over, and, but I will we'll pick up this uh, next week. There were two main line of thinking that impacted the church. One, a philosophy. One was called Gnosticism, and the other one was called Docetism. And next week, we're going to go into that and look at because John is addressing head-on these two philosophical views, which come into collision with the message of the faith. And it is dealing with this problem of do, uh, uh, Gnosticism and Docetism, this is what John is addressing in this letter, refuting it, and in the process of doing so, he presents these tests of what, a true, what is true belief and what is false belief. And believe me, these two, uh, especially uh, Gnosticism, has had a great influence in, in the Christian uh, church throughout the centuries. And, and so in the next few weeks, we're going to see how John deals with that and, and uh, the blessing that we get from, uh, from this part of the Word of God concerning our assurance of salvation. Any questions? We have one minute. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much. Uh, for my brothers and sisters, thank you so much for your word, that it is a light unto our feet, that you have not left us to our own devices and our own thinking, but you, you have given us your word, and we can look into it and rejoice in it and learn to love you as we need and as we ought to love you. Now, Lord, prepare us for our worship um, to you as a congregation. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.